G'day guys, welcome back to ADBC History. I'm Dan, your host, and today we'll be going through part three of our series on the ancient Olympics and sport and athletics in ancient Greece. Today we'll be covering athletic training, athletes' diets, the judges at the competitions, what it was like to be a spectator at the ancient Olympics, and of course, women in ancient Greek sport. I hope you've enjoyed this three-part series on Ancient Greece. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already so you don't miss our forthcoming subsequent series on sport, athletics, and of course, gladiatorial combat in ancient Rome. That'll be coming out at some point in the near future, so subscribe if you haven't already. But without any further ado, let's get into part three on sport and athletics in Ancient Greece. So, the athletes behind the scenes. As I said in the previous video, there were no national teams. The athletes weren't supported by anyone other than their own income, and they traveled and competed on whatever prize money they could acquire. In the case of the Olympics, they had to arrive at the city of Elis, which is near Olympia and was the city that administered the games at least a month beforehand. The judges then watched them train and trimmed out the ones who weren't good enough, which is a sort of qualifying round, to make sure that of the contests at the famous Olympic Games, only the best athletes could participate. The athletes training. We know quite a lot about how the athletes trained actually, due to athletic training manuals, which were books written by ancient Greeks and Romans on how athletes should best train. And we're gonna talk a little bit about one of these in a minute, written by a guy called Philostratus. But on the experience of being an athlete and athletic training, the author Epictetus in his discourses has the following to say. You say, I want to win at Olympia. If you do, you will have to obey instructions, eat according to regulations, keep away from desserts, exercise on a fixed schedule at definite hours in both heat and cold. You must not drink cold water, nor can you have a drink of wine whenever you want. You must hand yourself over to your coach exactly as you would to a doctor. Then in the contest itself, you must gouge and be gouged. There will be times when you will sprain a wrist, turn your ankle, swallow mouthfuls of sand, and be flogged. And after that, there are times when you will lose. Reading that, it's amazing that anyone chose to participate in the ancient Olympics. So, Philostratus, who wrote a book called Gymnasticus, which was, as I said, an athletic manual instructing athletes how they should best be trained. This was written in the second century AD, at the height of the Roman Empire, a time at which Greek athletics were still flourishing, perhaps more so than ever. And across the Mediterranean, there were a wide range of international competitions, which athletes traveled between competing at the highest level. It really was, at this time, the golden age of ancient sport. So, on the athlete's diet, Philostratus has the following to say. The old school did not even recognize such a thing as temperament, but trained only physical strength. Barley cakes served as their food and unleavened bread of unsifted wheat, and their meats were of the ox, the bull, the goat, and the roe. And they anointed themselves richly with oil from the wild olive and the oleaster. In this way, they were free from illnesses when training and grew old slowly. But, and I've just summarized a few interceding paragraphs, athletic training changed over time. They brought in luxurious chefs and caterers by whom men were made into epicures and gluttons. An epicure, by the way, is someone who's really into tasting fancy food. Treated to indigestible bread sprinkled with poppy seed. Contrary to regulations, they made use of fish as food. Still further, the doctors brought on the flesh of the swine with wondrous tales about it, directing that herds of swine down by the sea should be considered injurious on account of the sea garlic which grows in abundance along the shore and coast, and prohibiting the use of those near rivers because they may have fed on crabs. The only kind of pigs they recommended eating while training were those fattened on cornel berries or acorns. Talking about athletic competitions in the wider Greek and Roman world, athletic competitions were even used as a form of calendar. Ancient Greece didn't have a BC AD system like we do. In fact, they didn't count years at all. 
until the time of the Seleucid Empire in the Hellenistic period, which invented the world's first numerical system of counting years. But that's something we'll talk about more in a future video. So a variety of dating systems were used in the ancient Greek world, but the most common and most enduring was to count how many Olympics had passed. For example, something happened in the 51st year after the Second Olympiad. The first Olympics were supposedly in 776 BC. They probably weren't actually, but that's what the Greeks believed and that's the day they counted from. So the second year after the 51st Olympiad would be 502 BC. Don't check that maths. I'm not very good at maths. Just work with me here. So modern historians who are better at maths than I am often use this to figure out when stuff happened. If a particular source says that it happened three years after the 72nd Olympiad, we can use that to give it an absolute date and even to then compare it to things that were happening in other societies around the world. For example, this is an inscription from the city of Magnesia on the Mianda in modern day Turkey, which has this particular formula for dating an extremely important event, which was actually the foundation of their own major athletic competition. And it says, and the above is in Greek obviously, when Xenotidus was Stephanophoros, which is to say the wreath carrier, which is a way of saying the person who organized the athletic competitions because he would probably have put them on the heads of the victorious athletes when they won. Anyway, when Xenotitus was the Stephanophoros in the year that Thrasophon was Archon in Athens, that is to say the, the head minister, something sort of a little bit like a prime minister in Athens, the first year of the Pythia in which someone from Boeotia, we don't know that particular part of the inscription sadly is damaged, was the victor in the lute playing one year before the 140th Olympiad when Hegesidamus the Mycenaean won in the Pancration for the third time. Especially that last sentence there about the year before the Olympiad and the Pancration victor, also the Stadion victor is also commonly used. That's a really typical ancient Greek dating phrase. You see that a lot in inscriptions. So let's talk about the judges. At Olympia they were called the Hellenodikai, the judges of the Greeks. They wore a purple robe and carried a forked stick, which they would actually hit you with if you broke any of the rules, including mid-competition. So it could have been the grand final of the boxing at the Olympic Games, and the judge would just walk on and start whacking people with his stick if they broke any of the rules. And in this pottery example here on the right-hand side, you can see in the center, there's two guys. I think that might be the Pancration, where uh, eye gouging is specifically banned. And you can see one of the athletes got his finger up in his opponent's eye. And just to the right of them is a judge wearing a robe that would have presumably been colored purple, just not in this red figure pottery example. With his forked stick held over his head about to beat the offending athlete for committing this crime. All of the judges came from the nearby city of Ellis, which I just mentioned as they organized the Olympics. But the judges actually had to be banned from the Olympics in the late 300s BC for cheating in the horse races. And it, which is astonishing to me that they ever would have been allowed to compete in the first place. You'd think that they would be required to be removed to be impartial, but no, they were for, for hundreds of years of the Olympics, the judges were actually allowed to compete. So spectators at the games, we're back with Epictetus and his discourses. And he said, but you may say there are some things disagreeable and troublesome in life. And are there none at Olympia? Are you not scorched? Are you not pressed by a crowd? Are you not without comfortable means of bathing? Are you not wet when it rains? Have you not abundance of noise, clamour and other disagreeable things? But I suppose that setting all these things off against the magnificence of the spectacle, you bear and endure. Everyone slept in tents at Olympia, and there were hundreds of thousands of them. As I was saying in the first video in this series, the Olympic Stadium alone could seat probably about 100,000 people at any one time. So there would have been hundreds of thousands of people watching the Olympia at any particular Olympic festival. Another author called Aelian says that Plato, yes, the famous one, had to share a tent with strangers while he was there because he couldn't get a tent of his own. So the experience must have been something like a very major music festival. Lots of mud, crowds, poor sanitation. It must have stunk from all the sweaty people. It can get quite hot in Greece, especially in summer. So everyone would have been really smelly. There is only a very small creek near to Olympia, which doesn't actually run all year round. So there would have been almost nowhere to properly wash. A huge city of tents that would have expanded in all directions around the sanctuary. 
the sanctuary itself within the, the sacred boundary of Olympia was sacred, I don't think anyone would have been allowed to pitch tents in there. That would have been absolutely forbidden. But there would have been a huge tent city of hundreds of thousands of people, which is larger than even the largest of cities in ancient Greece. So for the several days of the Olympic festival, Olympia would have actually been the largest city in ancient Greece by a considerable margin. And lots of mostly naked people, not just the athletes who were fully naked, but also the Greeks who in hot weather wore very little clothing and just wore a simple tunic or even just a robe. As you can see from this previous example, where the judge on the right hand side is just wearing his purple robe and really not much else. So yeah, you can imagine it probably would have been a bit like a big music festival. And another ancient author called Diochrysitum writes of the Isthmian Games, though this would have been much the same at the ancient Olympics. Round the temple of Poseidon, you could see and hear the accursed sophists, which is another word for philosophers, basically, shouting and abusing one another, and their so-called pupils fighting each other. Many authors giving readings of their works, which no one listens to. Many poets reciting their poems, and others expressing approval of them. Many conjurers performing their tricks, and many fortune tellers interpreting omens. Thousands of lawyers arguing cases, and a host of cheap jacks selling everything under the sun. So, who was excluded from the Olympics? Ancient Greece was, after all, a highly exclusive society, where only some people were allowed to fully live life to the fullest. So here's an inscription from Beroia in Macedonia, which gives us some good evidence. No slave is to disrobe in the gymnasium, which is to say, train or compete in any sports which were done naked. If they were still had their clothes on, they weren't involved in athletics, is how we interpret this. No slave is to disrobe in the gymnasium, nor any freedman, which is of someone who used to be a slave but became free, nor their sons, nor cripples, nor homosexuals, which is a little hypocritical for ancient Greece, but okay, nor those engaged in commercial craft, nor drunkards, nor madmen. If the gymnasiarch, that's the person who runs the gymnasium and supplied the athletes with olive oil and other such things, knowingly allows any of the aforementioned to be oiled, as athletes and those training rub themselves down with olive oil at the start of every session, or continues to allow them after having received a report of them, he is to be penalised 1,000 drachmae. 1,000 drachmae, by the way, is an enormous amount of money. That's about three years' salary for the average person. For a rich person, that's still quite a lot of money. So a talent is 6,000 drachmae. You could run an entire warship with a crew of nearly 200 people for one talent a year. So that's one-sixth of the cost of a warship. That's a huge amount of money, a very, very serious fine. So we can interpret from this that the Greeks were very, very concerned about making sure that athletics and sport was an exclusive club just for free adult males and also to some extent children of both genders, which we'll talk about in a moment. One other thing that's not mentioned here is that non-Greeks were absolutely not allowed to participate in athletics. It was very important to the Greeks that only Greeks competed. And in the Hellenistic period, when athletics spread under the Macedonian kingdoms that emerged after the death of Alexander the Great, across a wide stretch of areas that were not traditionally culturally Greek, non-Greeks had to go to great lengths to acquire a, an appearance of Greek culture, like taking Greek names and other such things in order to be able to compete in the games. So, adult women were not allowed at the Olympics in the classical period at all. Not only could they not compete, but they weren't even allowed to come and watch. Which is why it's particularly ironic that, as I said in the previous video, it was the owners of a chariot that were given the award for winning a race, right? And women could own and run a chariot team, such as the Ptolemaic Queens, but they couldn't actually go to the Olympics, so they could be Olympic victors, even though they weren't even allowed into the place. This rule gradually relaxed over time. First, the priestess of Demeter, who's one of the major gods in the Olympic pantheon. Then, noble women who owned horses in the event, as I was just saying, were allowed to attend. And then, eventually, by the Roman period, all women were allowed to attend. Female children may have been allowed for all of this time, or possibly just the, the priestess of Demeter's attendants, who would have been young girls. It's unclear from the wording of the text that discusses this exactly what that means. 
Women definitely tried to sneak in to see the Olympics. There was one who wanted to see her son compete, and when she won, she got so excited that she jumped over the fence onto the field, her dress flew up, and she was revealed, let's say, to be female. If they were caught, they were actually usually thrown off a cliff, which I think is quite extraordinary. But this lady got away with it somehow. I've read an interesting theory that she was related to one of the Spartan kings, and it would have been very poor form for the governors of Ellis to toss this very important lady off a cliff because the Spartans probably would have invaded and killed them all. So that could be why she got away with it. Anyway, that's mostly just speculation. Anyway, wrapping up with women in Greek athletics. So women obviously did not compete at Olympia as they weren't allowed into the place, but they could still win the equestrian contest, as I mentioned. So the first recorded female Olympic victor was Kyniska of Sparta in 394 BC, and many Hellenistic queens did the same. There was a female-only contest, however, at Olympia called the Horaya, which was a female-only competition it was held roughly at the same time as the Olympics, so only women competed in that competition. There is evidence suggesting contests for young girls at the Pythian Games, and at games below the level of the Big Four, the Chromatic Games, which I was discussing in the first video. Contests for young girls below the age of marriage were possibly quite widespread. In Sparta, at least, every young girl had an athletic education. It was viewed as an essential part of a young woman's life, just as a young man, that she become physically fit. And in the Hellenistic period, this may have also become quite widespread to a number of Greek cities. On the left, we have an interesting little statuette. It is, to my knowledge, the only one of its kind that's ever been found in ancient Greece, and it was found in Sparta and this is believed to possibly be a woman competing in athletics. So as you can see, she's got some kind of dress on that goes up her chest, covering one breast and leaving the other breast bare. So is this a nod to the competing naked kind of thing, even though she's partially covered, not entirely sure, but she is quite obviously female. There's no way that this character can be interpreted as male. The alternate theory is that she's dancing. Right, And the thing is, is that we, we just don't know. She could be actually doing athletics, she could be dancing, we don't know, but that's the way that this famous statue is sometimes interpreted. So, that's all we have time for today. It's such a shame I could talk about this topic for hours. It's something that I love to discuss. If you'd like to learn more about ancient Greek athletics, I'd recommend you read the Victory Odes of Pindar, who wrote these epic poems praising athletes for their amazing victories. I'm currently working on another series to follow this one on sport and athletics in the Roman world, where we will, of course, focus on the great gladiatorial games in the Colosseum at Rome, and how gladiators trained, how they competed against each other, other, what kind of weapons they used, all of that cool stuff. That's coming up soon in the very near future, so make sure you subscribe if you haven't already so you don't miss out on that awesome following series. But for now, thank you very much for watching. I'm your host Dan, this is ADBC History, and I'll see you next time.